Kato. So uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. We're going to be discussing compressed air system demand and in particular talking about what's actually needed versus actually what's being used. Um, so those of you that joined our webinar before Christmas, you'll recognise a couple of the slides today and what we're going to do is we're going to take the uh, examples that we've used previously and go into a little bit more detail and look at what this and how this actually translates. So uh, on that note, we'll, uh, we'll get stuck in and uh, get underway. So just a, a quick reminder for ourselves, why do we even care? Why do we worry about compressed air? Obviously, there's uh, plenty of good reasons. Um, emissions, climate change, energy costs are increasing. They might not be increasing dramatically at the moment with a low global oil price, but long term, they're certainly trending up rather than down. And uh, down the bottom there, as it says, it's a forgotten utility. And uh, the key point, and uh, some people may tire of me saying this and might be a little bit sceptical that it's actually true, but there are plenty of instances where there's some savings in excess of 50%, which can start to add up. Now, um, actually, the examples that we'll go through today, um, you, indeed, you'll actually see that that number is actually much bigger than that. Um, so yeah, so on that note, just a reminder to refresh ourselves, we're going to be talking about um, primarily the demand side of the system today as opposed to the supply. We will touch later on on how the demand then impacts on what happens in the supply. So just a quick reminder for ourselves, if we look at our compressed air system here, you'll see our demand side is everything that's sort of greyed out. So we have uh, pneumatic tools, we uh, might have machines that are using compressed air, might be uh, actuators, uh, cylinders, valves, etc. And so generally what we do is if we go back to our primary uh, receiver, which is this big red one up here, is typically downstream from that is what we would consider the demand, and upstream of that would be what we'd con call the compressor plant room or the supply side of the system. And so primarily today we're going to be focusing on the demand side. Okay, so just a quick review here. Um, number one, top of the uh, top of the rank is always going to be air leaks. Um, potentially 10 to 50 percent reductions. We've certainly seen um, many sites where it's quite a bit more than that. Um, but uh, but generally there's not too many sites where it's less than 10, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and to be fair, if you are on a site which has a very good leak rate, i.e. very, very small, you will know about it, you'll see it in the housekeeping um, as we, uh, when we do this sort of training with people, um, it's something that we cover in detail and generally what you'll find is when you walk inside the plant room within the first five minutes, there's things like this that will be able to point quite clearly to the fact that chances are you could actually be looking at a best in class system. Very rare, very few and far between, but yes, they do exist. Artificial demand, we're going to define that shortly. Um, once again, five to sort of 50% savings, um, quite readily achievable. And obviously the mix of this depends largely on the end use of air and the nature of the system and what it's supplying. Inappropriate use, we'll differentiate between those two shortly. Uh, we have peak load reduction. This is uh, knocking off uh, the peaks. Do we need the peaks? Can the peaks be managed other ways as opposed to just sizing a bigger compressor? And we're actually going to talk about that a little later. Now, what we've also got is a system pressure reduction. And we'll, co we'll come back at, towards the end of the presentation today and discuss a little bit about this and how this can uh, impact. Now what we're talking about there in terms of system pressure reduction, that 45 to 9% is typically what you'll get in terms of the power consumption of the compressor. And so with our compressor, the uh, if we sort of drop our discharge pressure for, at the compressor from say 7.5 bar to 6.5 bar, that's a 1 bar reduction, which means the compressor is working a lot less uh, um, less hard, which means you're going to reduce your power consumption. Now, depending on the nature of the uh, compressor technology and use, we sort of, as a rule of thumb, work on between 6 and 9% power 
reduction if you drop that one bar at the discharge pressure on the compressor. And so we'll come back and talk about the implications of that a little later today. Now, when you sum all of this up, it's quite typical, and this is really the, 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 the guts of the uh, presentation today, is you will find that on most systems, the actual compressed air that needs to be used will be less than 50% of the current usage or the current demand. In other words, you can probably cut your air demand in half and still preserve all the functionality that you need from your system, which starts to become substantial. Now obviously that's going to deliver energy savings, it's going to reduce your emissions, obviously I'm assuming that your electricity has an emissions component to it, so depending on uh, where you're getting your electricity from that may or may not be relevant. Okay, and then the big one here is as you start to reduce your demand substantially, you start to then impact on the maintenance costs of your system, especially you reduce the number of compressors you could be using and so forth. Okay, so what we're going to do today is um, we're going to use a fictitious typical plant. And so what we've done is we've said, look, this plant's got 200 kilowatts of compressed air. I've got some CFM numbers and cubic metres an hour, depending on uh, what sort of units you're familiar with. And then what we've done is we've sort of broken it down and we've taken a fairly modest leak rate of 25%. So in other words, we've got 50 kilowatts of our 200 kilowatts is just feeding our leaks. Then we've got a whole host of valves and cylinders, actuators and the like that are um, cycling away. And they represent another 25% of the system. We have some pneumatic conveying where we're using compressed air to uh, convey some uh, um, residues and dust, etc. away. We then have some vacuum generators um, in terms of some packing equipment perhaps. We have uh, some blowdown applications and then we have a couple of bearings that have got a little hot and so to uh, to compensate, we're uh, using a bit of compressed air to keep those critical bearings cool. Now you might think, uh, you know, that's incredibly wasteful, but there might be a justification from the point of view that bearing could be on a critical piece of kit, you can't shut it down to repair, it could be an expensive bearing, it might uh, take some time to get the parts organised, so for a period of time we've got a few bearings that we're keeping cool. So you can see there we've got 25, 25, and then 25, and then 10, 10, 5, giving us 100% or our 200 kilowatts. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this list one by one and look in a bit more detail and address or try and look at, well, what does this actually mean? What is it that we actually need versus what we're currently using and how do we realise those savings? So obviously the first thing is, the obvious thing is we should start with our leaks. And then I guess there, there will be some that will say, well, why bother about our leaks? Well, the simple answer is, is it's a quick win. Generally, you're talking a very short payback. You can free up a spare compressor. It's a base load reduction. And then as we've mentioned previously, you can talk about maintenance savings. Now, 15 years ago, the Department of Energy best practice target in the US was about 10% of your total demand is an acceptable leak rate. Nowadays, that's dropped to 5%. Um, ultrasonic leak detection uh, technology is certainly well established and well used. It's, it takes you well beyond just being able to fix the leaks that you can audibly hear. It's uh, now about fixing the leaks that you should be fixing because you can determine where they are. Now I guess the question I want to pose for you this morning is to, to, to leave it there for you to think about. There's a reason this target isn't actually 0%. Now, it might depend a little bit on terms of your in industry application, but if you've got zero leaks, you have to start asking yourself, are you overspending on your maintenance budget versus what those leaks are actually costing you? And so there is an optimization in terms of your spend. Now, with that in mind, it's, it's useful to remember that leaks are a regressive opportunity, meaning it's something you have to commit to on an ongoing basis, you need to set up a program to keep them in check, and ultimately that program should be set to optimise the frequency at which you are looking for leaks, and potentially the threshold of a leak in terms of what you bother to fix. Now, as you get more mature and uh, escalate the uh, 
the sophistication of your program, you might start looking at replacing um, equipment, moving from uh, flexible fittings to more hard lines and the likes where you eliminate sources of leaks. Typically 50% of all leaks are uh, fitting related, especially your push fit fittings and plastic tubing and the like. Combination of better material selection, um, choosing the right fittings that will have a much longer life, reduce your leak rates, etc. So being smarter with what you do, and this is the sort of the thing that you'll uh, do to improve what you currently do. Now, if we take that in mind, looking at our, our, our plant here, if we're getting proactive, you'll notice that our leak rate is dropped from our 25% to 5%. I've uh, been realistic here and saying, well, look, we're not going to get to zero. And you'll notice that obviously fairly simple, 20% straight off the top, we're now at 80% on our bottom line. So fairly straightforward. Um, and of course, you know, this is a really good place to start. Now, obviously, once we've done that, we then need to start to look at our various other demand reduction opportunities. So artificial demand, inappropriate use, and so on. And so what we want to do is just very quickly remind ourselves artificial demand is the excess demand above what is actually required. Now, put simply, you know, we're talking about unregulated end uses, high system pressures than what we need, which ultimately means that we're going to use more air than we need to. See, the key point here is pressure is obviously directly proportional to the flow or the amount of air that we're going to use and pressure in absolute terms. And so if we look at this example, if we have a series of pneumatic control valves, um, actuators, cylinders and the like, they're typically going to be sized and spec to run on four and a half bar, or four, four and a half bar. Now, if you're using a seven bar system, okay, then that means every time that valve actuates, every time that cylinder actuates, it's a fixed volume of air that's being discharged. Now, if you're running at a higher pressure, it means that you're going to use more air than you actually need to. So you may recall these numbers from last time, but very quickly, um, it means that if we use a seven bar as opposed to five bar, so we've still got a bit of a uh, headroom there, it's a 25% uh, reduction in going from our seven bar to five bar. If we go only to six bar, then obviously it's 12.5%. So what this really means is if we take all of the air that we're using to run our valves and our actuators, our cylinders, etc., and we actually regulate the pressure at the end use down to where it needs to be, still be comfortable, um, potentially have a uh, little receiver there, um, we might have a point of use, uh, you know, 50 litre receiver for argument's sake uh, in, uh, in, in the line next to our valve bank, um, which will improve our localised pressure there. We we'll certainly won't have any problems in terms of maintaining our minimum pressure. And what we want to do is let's look at the savings that that would deliver. So here we go. So if we regulate our pressure from 7 down to 5, Okay, and if we're using 50 kilowatts of compressed air, we're going we're gonna to save 12.5 kilowatts, which is 109,000 kilowatt hours on a 24-7 operation or 50,000 on a sort of two shift, five days a week operation. So you're between five and 10 grand a year in savings. Now to do that, and all you've got to do is pay for a few regulators and a couple of little receivers, the payback is going to be well inside um, a few months. And, and quite achievable. Now, if you ramp that up, if you go to a much bigger site, you can see that the annualised saving starts to become quite substantial. So if you've got a 200 kilowatt system um, where it's all valves and cylinders, you're talking 50 kilowatts in savings, um, 438 kilowatt hours, which is sort of 43 grand, 44 grand a year. Um, obviously, if you're two shifts a day, um, then it drops to 20. But start, still fairly substantial when your cost to achieve this are a couple of regulators and, uh, and if you really want to make sure in terms of insurance, um, a couple of little localised small volume receivers. And the smart option would be to put little receivers that are well under a cubic metre so they're non-surveyable to minimise your annual maintenance costs. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of our typical plant? Well, coming back to this typical plant, we have valves and cylinders, um, 
what obviously was uh, 50 kilowatts is now 37.5, so we've gone from 25 down to 18.8 percent. So we've dropped our bottom line there's gone from 80 down to 73, 74 percent. So this number is already dropping quite dramatically. Now, what we want to talk about now is we go back to a pneumatic conveying example. So we might be using or require three bar air to convey our particulates, our residues away from it could be a sander, a polisher, um, could be build up of sawdust on a piece of equipment or other material. Okay, now if we're using seven bar as opposed to three bar, okay, our reduction in just straight air use is 50%. Obviously three and a half bar, four bar, obviously those, uh, those reductions drop off. Now, the other scenario here is if we actually replace the compressed air being used to um, convey our material and actually use a blower system, that substitution can actually result in a 75% saving. Now what that would actually entail is, is an elimination of the compressed air load itself and a replacement with a blower system with a much smaller power consumption. So to give you an idea, step one obviously would be to just regulate down our compressed air usage. Okay, and so you can see the saving starts to build up and get quite substantial. Um, so if we take once again our 200 kilowatt system, if it was 200 kilowatts of air doing pneumatic conveying, that drops to 100. And so you can see that's an $87,000 saving with just some regulators. Now with that in mind, you think fantastic, that's an easy gimme, let's do that. Well, the counter to that is actually, why don't we use a blower? We can save even more than that. So if we substitute with a blower, suddenly that same scenario, our 200, kilo, 200 kilowatts, we save 150 kilowatts. That 87 now becomes $131,000 per, per annum or 60,000 on a uh, two shift, five day a week operation. Now, what isn't included in these figures? is the fact that when you run a system like that, if you are generating air at seven bar gauge at the outlet to the compressor, and then you regulate it down to three bar, you have still used a lot more energy to generate that compressed air at seven bar than you needed to. So all of that energy is lost through the pressure reduction, there's no recovery. And uh, so in addition to these savings, these savings are just the demand reduction in terms of volume of air used. In addition to these, there'll actually be a supply side saving if you actually went with a low pressure compressed air system. So you can get sort of a low pressure um, compressor that might be able to generate three bar as opposed to letting down seven bar like your traditional instrument air compressor. Uh, now obviously, neither of those compare to using a blower where the savings are quite a bit more substantial. So what we're going to do is if we go back to our, our typical plant here, um, what we've got once again is, uh, is our pneumatic conveying has dropped in half. This is assuming that we've just regulated the air down and so we're now down to 61% overall. Now alternately, if we throw a blower in, you'll notice that our pneumatic conveying in terms of our compressed air has dropped to zero and what we've done is we've introduced a, uh, a replacement of other power which is our blower system and you'll notice that we've displaced 12.5% up here with only 6.3% or 6.25% if we don't uh, have the rounding and so you can see we start to really add up and at this point now even though our, our new air usage is under 50% even with the extra blower we're still sitting at 55% so substantial savings are starting to stack up. Now you can talk about an artificial leak rate. So as we talk about um, you know, our line pressure, our system pressure, if we're running our system pressure higher than what we need to because we don't have storage, what that means is everywhere in our system we're running a higher pressure than we need to. And of course because our flow is proportional to our pressure, everything that is leaking is leaking at a higher rate than it needs to be. So it's important to remind ourselves on a seven and a half bar system, okay, if we drop our pressure to six bar, we actually have a 17% reduction 
in our leak losses right across the entire system. Now that's separate to our power savings of running our compressors at a lower pressure. So just purely in terms of demand reduction, lowering our system pressure is going to reduce our leak rate. Now if we only go to 6.5 bar, it's 11.7% and obviously just under 6% if we only go to 7 bar. So you can see that actually reducing our system pressure does wonders for our, uh, our uh, losses across our leak rate. And this is without actually fixing the leaks. It just literally drops the loss in terms of uh, CFM or cubic metres an hour, cubic metres a minute, however you want to count it. And, uh, and that's without actually fixing the leaks. Now obviously you fix the leaks, you capture the rest of it. Um, that being said, um, you, uh, you, you obviously still have your savings in terms of the, uh, the power consumption at the compressor. Okay, now how do we make these savings? Well, you can fix leaks, you can reduce your system pressure, put extra storage in so you can have a lower pressure. Then you have to look at your pipe work. Now the reason the pipe work is interesting, of course, is as you drop your system pressure, the, uh, the, uh, the airflow to deliver obviously increases, so you are going to get a slight increase in the line velocity for the flow that you actually need, which is going to increase your line pressure drop marginally. Now we are talking very, very minor or increases in that pressure drop and obviously that is generally more than more than not uh, compensated by having better storage and actually uh, uh, reduced peak loads and then actually your peak velocities drop so it's your peak uh, line pressure drop that becomes a problem rather than your overall line pressure drop. Um, so typically you would you would struggle to measure that increase in line pressure drop unless you really really um, had substantial flows and the pipe size was marginal. Okay, so just a reminder that dropping the system pressure 7.5 bar to 6 bar immediately eliminates 17.5% of our leaks without actually touching any of the leaks. So it's the quickest way to capture um, some of our, uh, our leak savings. Now, you do have to be careful not to double count those savings. Now, compressed air shortcuts, um, obviously We've talked about already cooling bearings, agitating tanks, uh, air lances, blowing down, cleaning, using compressed air to generate a vacuum. We've already talked about pneumatic conveying, um, drying, cleaning, personal cooling. Um, compressed air is easy. It's perceived as being cheap even though it isn't. Um, and it's easy to tap into. Generally low capital cost because you can just punch a hole in a line and put an extra fitting in there. Um, and it's quite removed or decoupled from there needing to be another compressor over in the plant room. Now that being said, let's talk a little bit about some of these inappropriate uses. You know, and why does it happen? Well, capital cost of actually putting that use in is probably cheap because you don't fully cost the implications of putting a bigger compressor in. Certainly quick and easy time-wise. Uh, often the compressed air infrastructure is already in place. Typically the good thing about compressed air is we don't need an electrician, we can just tap into the line, it's sort of uh, it's not seen as something requiring someone with any particular skill. Um, certainly in the first instance there's no perceived capacity constraint and I guess that's what's interesting with compressed air, there's no capacity constraint until there is one and then it's a major problem because all of a sudden you can't maintain pressure and then everything stops working and then you get caught into a bind and then the simple solution is to put another compressor in. Now there's plenty of compressor suppliers out there and I apologise in advance for what I'm about to say. They see that, no, I may see that as a good thing and as an opportunity to sell you another machine. Now to give some, some credit, there'll be some out there that will argue that actually they don't want to sell you another machine, they would rather help you to uh, to sort out your problems and have the right size compressor that you need. Your challenge as a, as a system manager or system owner or system operator is to be able to ask those tough questions of your suppliers and you'll be able to figure out very quickly those suppliers that you want to be working with and those that you're probably better off giving a wide berth. Okay, so how do we address all this wastage? Well, it's back to education and training, providing suitable alternatives, eliminating access, 
improving standards and workplace practices and obviously being able to understand these savings calculations. Now this webinar will be available so you can download it and look at these slides and you can figure out, I've, I've tried to with the scenarios pick some numbers that are fairly uh, universal. You'll notice if you do the uh, calculations, the power price savings have been just converted at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, which means if your power price is 12 cents, you can times it by 1.2. If your power price is 8 cents, then you times it by 0.8. So it's fairly easy for you to take those numbers and adjust them to meet your needs. So we want to just take a, a minute or two to talk about vacuum today. And there's plenty of compressed air driven vacuum generators out there on the market. Now as a typical rule of thumb, now this will depend a little bit in terms of the level of vacuum that you're needing to generate, but your typical savings are in the order of 75% and the added bonus with the new health and safety legislation that's out there, you may be able to sell this not so much on the energy, but on the safety grounds and the fact that you've got a high level of uh, ambient noise and if you've got workers in the area, the best thing you can do is drop that noise. Okay, so if we come back to our vacuum generators, what we're actually going to do here is we're going to eliminate compressed air as being used to generate our vacuum. And you'll notice that down the bottom here, we've actually increased and put in five kilowatts extra of an actual dedicated vacuum system in its place. So you'll notice that our air use has dropped substantially and we've had a minor increase in our other power used. Now just on this note, as another good example, we're going to talk about blowers here for a minute. Now this is an example that we've referred to before, so we've added a little bit more information to help you to understand what's going on. So to the, to the right we have a blower, now this particular installation it was a 37 kilowatt blower um, running around the clock, um, about $32,500 per annum to run. And the typical specific power consumption of a blower, you're generating air at a certain pressure and it's generally a volume as opposed to a pressure requirement um, and you'll see there that the specific power is about 1.4 to 1.6 kilowatts per cubic metre a minute. Now to be fair here, there's a very important qualifier on those numbers, it will depend on the specific application in terms of uh, pressures especially as to what the exact specific power would be for your application. Now with that in mind, if you compare that to the left, we have the blower on the right actually broke down um, and so the site had a large compressed air system. I thought, well great, we'll just tap into the compressed air, we won't bother fixing the blower, that we couldn't get the money um, to do that in the budget, so we'll just use our compressed air. Now what's interesting of course is to displace that amount of air, it actually required over 200 kilowatts of compressed air, or in other words, $175,000 per annum to run that system. Now, your specific power, of course, for your compressor, as a, as a ballpark starting number, we use about seven kilowatts per cubic meter a minute. Now, to be fair, that will go up and down depending on the nature of the compressor, i.e. the compressor technology, the uh, type of installation, how you're drying the air and so forth but as a rough rule of thumb, you can see there's quite a disparity there. Now what of course is interesting here is inside one year you could pay for and then some, a brand new blower, never mind repairing the old one. So sometimes the economics is, is absolutely crazy, um, yet people still for whatever reason can't get past it. So the only thing we can do really is educate, educate and inform. And so here's just a really good example. So you got the best part of $140,000 there and that, that 37 kilowatt blower is not going to set you back that sort of money. So other examples of blowing, here's, here's an ice cream factory. You can uh, see over here, we've got some little nozzles blowing plastic into this bag and this is ex excess plastic packaging. Now as an alternative for these sorts of applications, if you do, and need, do indeed need to use the air, one of the best options is a vortex amplifier, which gives you sort of a 20 to 1 uh, amplification. So for every one part of compressed air, you get 20 parts of entrained airflow, and it's very good for spot cooling, dust removal, uh, air assist, that sort of thing. Um, you're talking 80 to 90% reduction in, uh, in air use. Um, for a simple little application like this, you're talking $12,000 savings in energy, 
Um, payback under a month, you're talking about uh, a sort of a couple of vortex generators are only going to be uh, you know, a few hundred dollars even allowing a generous uh, allowance for installation and so forth, the, the savings are just absolutely ridiculous to the point of being embarrassing. Now alternatively you could use a fan or in some instances actually you can just plain eliminate the use. We were at a site uh, recently where they were using compressed air to blow water out of bottles um, that were washed before they were being filled. And what was interesting actually they did a trial where they just turned the air system off and let the uh, bottles drain hanging upside down instead and it was actually uh, found that the bottles drained and dried better without the air being uh, blown around. And so what was interesting they literally had to turn a valve and eliminated 100% of that demand and it didn't even need to be replaced with uh, anything else. So it's, it's important to ask the tough questions and challenge and uh, establish what you can actually get away with. Um, so a typical plant here we're talking about. So what we've done is with our blowers we've taken a 75% reduction um, and actually left it there as an example and so we're down to two and a half percent and so you can see our total numbers are really starting to drop and even allowing for the extra um, other ancillary equipment that we've added we're now down to 40 percent of our original power consumption. Okay so berry cooling same sort of scenario we can use, use a vortex generator or a cooling fan a lot less noise and typical power savings of sort of 80 percent so when we update our chart you can see our bearing numbers have dropped there and so we're now down to 27% of our original air use, even allowing for the extra vacuum and uh, blowers, we're still only at 36% of where we started. So we've gone from 200 kilowatts down to 72. Now, as we uh, carry on today, obviously another key thing for us to think about is uh, balancing peak demand. Um, you know, so we've got some examples we're gonna look at, bag holes pulsing, cleaning air, um, purge air and the likes and uh, generally the solution to each of these is storage at the point of use um, and obviously what you can also then do is regulate your pressure on your receiver outlet not your inlet because then you diminish the use of your receiver okay and then other thing is you can look at pressure 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 triggered isolation valves so here's a chart where you can see a bag house is running and instantaneous demand is going from sort of under 50 to over, just over 300 at the peak. If we sort that cumulatively you'll see that actually to be fair the true demand probably actually sits between 50 and 100 and everything else is sort of due to inadequate local storage. So what does this really mean? Well we have an average load of 75 to 100 cubic meters an hour okay, which equates to only in this instance 8 to 12 kilowatts of compressor capacity. Now we've still got a peak load of 300 cubic meters an hour. And so what we want to bear in mind here and just to really signify the significance of that receiver, we need 35 kilowatts of compressor, which means you're going to end up with a 37 kilowatt compressor to meet peak demand. So if this is your system, you're going to have to select a 37 kilowatt compressor. Now the downside of that of course is on average that compressor is only going to be loaded 25% of the time. Oh sorry, or, or at 25% full load. Now the problem with that of course is for most compressors that's actually below the minimum load point or the maximum turn down that most VSD driven compressors are going to handle and that's certainly more than what uh, variable valve uh, or exit uh, port tuning various compressors that use different technology to turn down their capacity. So here, here in this scenario we'd have to run a compressor to the point where it's going to be loading and unloading even with a variable capacity unit because our average load is below what the peak and, and therefore how the compressor has been sized. So never mind um, the actual extra capital going into the compressor, you've got the added hassle that your machine's not going to be loaded well, which means it's uh, going to have a build up of moisture, even if it's fitted with a dryer, it, it's dryer's not going to function properly because of the intermittent load. Um, that then follows through with uh, wear and tear on the machine coming on and off on a very, very rapid cycle. And so clearly it becomes very 
uh, simple and easy to see that the best thing to do is actually look at having the receiver that you need to have so that you can eliminate that peak demand which is not actually necessary you can size your receiver appropriately and you can see you go from 37 to probably 11 kilowatt compressor here's another really good example and this is where you've got your base load system and then you've got a, a cleaning crew coming in and you can see the spikes with the cleaning crew using compressed air to clean so here's your artificial peak over here at the end and so if we look at these numbers again okay so we have an underlying demand of 500 to 1,000 cubes an hour with a mean of roughly about 800. So that's 58 to 116 kilowatts of compressor or an average of about 93 kilowatts. Now, if you were specking a compressor for this load, you'd be looking at 132 kilowatt or if it was me, I'd be looking at how we can have a little bit of a receiver there and, uh, and knock the top off that 116, fix a couple of leaks and presto we're down to 110 or even less. Now with that in mind, what that means is on average our compressor is going to be 71 to 85% loaded. Okay, and we're, now if we compare that to the peak load scenario, which will be 2700 cubic metres an hour, Okay, we're going to need a 315 kilowatt compressor to meet that peak demand. Now the problem with that of course is, is that might be our peak, but what we've got most of the time when the plant's running, our compressor is only going to be loaded 30%. So for our, if we had a VSD compressor sitting there, that VSD compressor is going to spend on average at just barely minimum load, it's going to be at its maximum turn down point and at some point you can bank on that thing having to load and unload. And of course when it loads, any compressor that uh, loads up after being unloaded and immediately loads up to full speed and then it's going to ramp back down. So it's going to create all sorts of control nightmares. So here's a really good example of not only is that use for cleaning probably a bad choice, it has massive consequences to how your system runs the majority of the time that you're not cleaning. So with that in mind, um, just to touch off, we want to talk a little bit about system pressure optimization. So as you address this excess demand that we're talking about by eliminating uh, the uh, inappropriate uses, reducing our system pressures, we've got local storage where we need it so we knock off these peak demands. Now some of those peaks can be uh, addressed with storage and some of them like the example that we just shared should be just straight out eliminated. Then once you're on top of all of that you're in a position to look at your compressor control strategy, looking at localised pressure alarms, system pressure controls, feed forward control perhaps in terms of sensing critical pressures further downstream into your system. As you lower your system pressure we're going to have less air demand, we're going to have less leak losses and our compressor efficiency back in our plant room is going to improve, reminding ourselves 6 to 9 percent reduction for every one bar um, discharge pressure reduction for the compressor. Now obviously that um, you know diminishes as we drop the pressure. So where does this leave us? Well in summary we want to start with leaks and then we should be addressing all significant air use um, and ensuring that it's regulated as opposed to unregulated so that we can drop and control the pressures so we're only using the air that we need to. Use local receivers with outlet pressure control where necessary and so this is where you can have a localised system for your valve banks where you can drop your pressure just locally at your valve bank with a receiver so it can handle, uh, handle the demand that will be placed on it. The other thing is obviously to then reduce or eliminate other inappropriate uses of air so we talked about blowing and uh, cooling, cleaning etc. Um, cooling of equipment that shouldn't be using compressed air to do that. Balance peak demands to uh, ensure that we are able to size machines and equipment appropriately. Um, point of view storage to address that or elimination of the demand. Okay, Can the size of the peak be managed and or lowered? In a lot of instances it can actually be eliminated. Um, then ultimately we can lower our overall system pressure. So in review, just t looking back at our typical plant, you can see that we started out with 200 kilowatts, we're down to 72, so we're effectively 64% reduction, even allowing for the additional equipment that's installed. So where does this all mean? Well there was our 200 kilowatts at the start, 
we only actually need 55 kilowatts of compressed air. Yes, there's an additional 17 and a half kilowatts of ancillary equipment, blowers and vacuums and so forth. Okay, so our net power saving is 64%. Now that's just in terms of demand reduction. There's actually additional energy savings on the supply side of the system. Now I haven't incorporated that in today's analysis for obvious reasons and the primary one being that once you make this sort of change to your system, you can just about guarantee that the compressor that you have is no longer the right size. So what savings you make in terms of efficiency of the compressor will no doubt be more than offset um, by additional unloaded running and compressors and them not being the most efficient uh, or not running in their most efficient uh, envelope. And so obviously this is just purely looking at power savings in terms of demand reduction. Following on from this, you then have to address the supply. Okay, but this should reinforce the point though that there's an absolute no point whatsoever in a looking at your compressed air supply until you have done this process or completed this process first. You must address the demand side first because it makes such a big difference to how much air you actually need. Now, the compressor suppliers probably aren't going to like this too much. It takes a little bit of time to do this, bed it in, improve it. But then what you do is you can see that it makes a big difference. And the biggest consequence here is it will actually delay the purchase of the new compressor because once you do this first and you bed it in, then you can reevaluate how much you need and then you're in a position to size the compressor. And so in a lot of cases, you can start out with an inquiry that says, hey, look, I'm running out of egg, I need a new compressor. And that whole process goes full circle and at the end of it, you realize, well, actually, we don't need a new compressor. Our existing one is actually too big. So the, the, the full circle of that is, yes, you may need a new compressor, but the new compressor could be a smaller, correctly sized compressor to replace your now oversized machine that you've currently got. Okay, but that's the key point is doing this the right way in the right order, you can then get the right equipment. Okay, and then once you've got the right equipment and you understand what your demand needs are, you're then in a position to understand the correct control strategy to then run and operate your system. So there are other considerations such as dew point, um, air treatment, etc., which also become a part of that scenario which will be covered in a future webinar. So that concludes our presentation today. I'm happy to stay on the line for a few questions, but just a reminder that we've got um, some future webinars coming up um, June the 1st on Flash Team, then uh, Fan System Measurements on the 15th, and then Boiler Corrosion and Deposition Failures with Dave Addison on the 29th of June. Just a reminder that registration links for those webinars are on our website, which is energyefficiencynz.com and then under the webinar tab. And then you've got your past webinars are on the YouTube, um, which is the ECA business channel on YouTube. So you can feel free to, if you just go to the YouTube site and then under the channels, if you do a search for ECA business, that will then come up and the webinars are all listed there. Um, and just a reminder that if you have a site and, and there's something here that you want to get some assistance with, um, feel free to talk to your ECA account manager or you can visit the ECA website. Um, so yeah, so on that note, thank you for signing in today and hope that that was useful for you. Um, the key thing here is, is you've got to have your details, you can do your numbers and the savings will be compelling and you'll be able to build the business case to uh, be able to justify making some changes to your system. Um, so yes, I will give you a few minutes if any of you have got any questions to send through. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, see you in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Okay, for those of you sending through your um, your comments and thanks, appreciate it um, and all the best. We will stay on the line uh, for a few more minutes if anyone does have a question.
Okay. Okay, I'll give you guys a uh, another minute, but it looks like um, uh, you guys are all good. <laughs> 